He will put a little bit of pressure on the man of God, won't he? Amen. But I appreciate your preacher and um, everything he said about Love Valley. The Lord is blessing, but it all started with uh, a little over 28 years ago, I got saved by God's grace. I'm a, I'm a first generation Christian, and um, wasn't nobody in my family saved. And um, I went to a revival meeting one night, and a preacher by the name of Dr. Ron Comfort was preaching. And um, he, uh, I didn't go there to get saved. I went there because some folks that on my job would not leave me alone. And uh, just kept on and kept on. And um, went there that night and, and, and didn't have any idea what I was getting. But I, I meant it with all my heart that I was going to give the Lord my life. That message was just convicted me. Uh, I really did see myself lost for the very first time. And I got saved and I went home and, and um, over the process of the next month or two, I saw my wife get saved and then my dad and then my mother and then my sisters. And, um, and so uh, I'm just excited to be saved. Excited to be saved. Took a while, took a while for my wife um, I, I didn't know, I thought what worked on me that night would work on her. So I went home, we stayed up all night, and um, I had them verses where everybody had showed me that night, which I saved, I believe, before I got to the altar. But my wheel broke, my heart crushed, I turned to the Lord before I ever left the pew. Um, but they, I led her down every road in the scripture. And she would pray, and uh, she would say, I just, uh, I just don't feel like nothing happened. And I, I called the preacher, and I said, I don't know that she's going to be able to get it. And um, I said, we, and we stayed up literally all night. I thought, man, I've married a reprobate, and here I am saved. <laughs> but um, about a month later, the Lord was faithful. She got under conviction and got saved. And um, today, today, she's the very best Christian I know. And um, I'm, I'm very thankful to be here. Your preacher, his reputation around these parts, I guess if I had to describe him, he's, uh, he's real. I like his. In these last days, could we say amen for somebody's real? Genuine. Amen. Amen. Absolutely beautiful building. Uh, probably, probably I am from the country, and uh, this is probably the biggest building I've ever preached in. Matter of fact, I'm talking a little bit to let my nerves calm down. But uh, I am humbled. It is meant for me to be here this week. It is meant for me to be here. We, we did work hard and finally got the days, and uh, I am very thankful. I am honored. I'll tell you this, I'm too busy, and, and people are too needy for me to come up here with a, with a, with a pet sermon uh, just, to, just to pass a, a time by. I want to give you what the Lord's put on my heart. I mean that, and I want to try to be a blessing to you. If I say anything in the next two or three days that goes against what your preacher said, your preacher's right. <laughs> it's exactly right. Now, when he comes down to our place, I'll be right. But uh, I, I mean that from my heart. You have got a great preacher. Great work. The buses, uh, we, we run 10 buses, and, and I'm, very, I'm very thankful to be around where somebody's got a burden for souls. Great spirit, great Folks are friendly. It's just amazing. All right, Mark chapter number 14. I want to thank the preachers, some of the men of God that I didn't get a chance to shake hands with. And, um, and uh, I appreciate you being here tonight, taking time out of your schedule. Uh, I want us to look, and you'll have to listen closely. I've got a little bit of a, uh, a little longer introduction to the message, but we'll come back and preach from this text tonight. Uh, for just a few minutes, I will not keep you long, but in Mark 14, uh, Jesus here in the text asked his disciples to go in the town and uh, to a certain place in verse number 12. Let's pick up our reading in Mark 14 in verse number 12. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover. And he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber? 
where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. Verse number 15, And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came unto the city and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Look in verse number 22, if you will. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Verse 23, And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Uh, the Lord tells his disciples here to go into the city to a certain place uh, that he plans to meet with them a little later. And their purpose in meeting together is to have what we refer to as the Passover meal. Um, we look at it in our day as the Lord's Supper. Uh, in these verses, Jesus institutes something that, that we still practice today, thank the Lord, and it's called the Lord's Supper, communion. I'm sure you do that on a regular basis. And, and uh, don't ever forget, there's two ordinances of the local New Testament church. One of them is baptism. That's where a man, woman, boy, or girl gets baptized, gets, uh, I'm sorry, gets born again. And uh, they get saved by God's grace. And, and um, when they, it's a public testimony of that sinner going, uh, being saved, portraying them going down in the water, coming back up, being raised in the newness of life. It won't save you. Um, it just makes you right with God when you get saved. It's something we ought to do is be baptized. So there's baptism, and then there's communion. There's the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul gives us uh, the church the commandment to do it and do it often. And uh, in the text, Jesus gives the examples and the instructions. And he says here that he takes the bread and he says, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then the juice. And he said, Drink, this is my blood, which was shed for you. And now, if, I, if I've got it right... This was a, it's a time of remembrance. It's a, it's a time of worship. Uh, when we do the communion and the, the, the Passover meal, it was a time when people would look back at, uh, for them, it was looking back to that night in Egypt when they were brought out and saved and delivered by the blood of the sacrificial lamb. And we look back to the cross. But it's a time of reflection, a time of remembrance. We look back to the cross. Amen, that allows folks like me and you to go to heaven when we die. But if I'm right about this, preacher, the only institution or organization on planet earth, get this now, that can do these two things, that can practice baptism or the Lord's Supper, is the local New Testament church. Am I, I believe I'm right about that. Uh, you can't do that at the YMCA. You can't, a, a homeschool group can't do that. No kind of other Christian group outside the church, I don't think, has got the authority uh, or the right to do, to do that, the Lord's Supper. So if I'm right, the Lord Jesus is telling them, I want you to go into the city and I'm going to meet you there and we're going to have the Lord's Supper. He's saying, don't you agree with me? He's saying, we're going to have church. Yeah. Amen. That's the only place that that can be taken, that we can take part in that is the church. So Jesus, I believe, is saying we're going to church. I'm going to meet you there, and we're going to go in, and we're going to have church. Well, uh, his disciples said, where wilt thou that we should go? And he tells them, and verse um, uh, 13 through 15, of course, the Lord gives them details where to go, and he meets with them, and they have the Lord's Supper, and what I call, they have a church service. If the Lord would help me for just a few minutes tonight, with that thought in mind, I want to preach on the kind of church that Jesus would go to. The kind of church that Jesus would go to. I think what we have in this text, in this setting, is a, is a picture of the church. I mean, they're, they're having the Lord's Supper. The Lord's there. Amen. They've got the Word of God there. Amen. And I, I'm, I'm thinking tonight if Jesus was in the area of Rule Hall, North Carolina, and he was, I don't know if you think about things like this, but in bodily form, if he was here tonight, where would he go to church? 
I don't never want to be a part of a church or attend or be a member of a church where Jesus wouldn't go to. Amen. I just don't want to do that. I want to be in a place where Jesus loves to show up. We had, a, we had a family years ago that for some reason just felt led to leave our church and, and they went about 20 miles down the road to a place and about eight weeks I went and spoke with them and I said, um, how's it going with your, with your new church? And both of them looked down and, and they said, preacher, we know the Lord sent us there, but they said, we've been there eight weeks, maybe even nine weeks and said, the, the best we can tell, the Lord just don't show up there. And I said, you know what's amazing about that is the Lord would tell you to go somewhere where he wouldn't go. Amen. I don't want to go where he don't go. Amen. We had a family that moved down in the uh, lower part of South Carolina and they had to find them a church. And, and they came back and they said, preacher, we love it. We, he said, we're not the thermometer of whether or not God's there. They said, but we just can't see where, where God ever shows up in any of the services. And that boy, they moved back home. Amen. That's a blessing. I mean to be where the Lord is. When it, it does not matter much if you and I are here tonight. It does not matter. We want, we, I want to be here and I want you to be here. But friend, it matters whether the touch of God shows up. Just that breeze, that presence of God that came by. Boy, that's good singing, ain't it? I believe God likes singing like that. Amen. I, I, when, when he's here, we can, his presence can be enjoyed. I, I, God can do more for your family in five minutes in a, in a service where the Holy Ghost shows up than you can ever do in your, in your entire life any other way. Amen. Just by, you can enjoy his presence. I, I absolutely love it when the Lord just kind of unplugs us from this sin-cursed world and plugs us into the glory world and let us fellowship just around the presence of God. Amen. Amen. His presence is enjoyed. His, his, uh, his power can be experienced. It's, it's when the Lord shows up that, that lives are delivered. Nobody, nobody has the power to change the life. But boy, you, you let the presence of God show up and it won't be long. He, everywhere he went in the scripture, he changed lives. Amen. Every city he went to, everywhere he showed up, somebody got changed. Amen. We had a, I was preaching a revival meeting in High Point and, and we got up and I was preaching and somewhere in the middle of the service, you could tell that out of mercy that God, the presence of God showed up and um, I'd, I'd not been there many times then and a lady stood up and um, I was preaching on how there's a, there's a way that seemeth right and, and God would have you stop if you're on the wrong road. And uh, she stood up in the service and started talking out loud. And I thought, oh, no. I, I said, I thought they didn't have other folks like that except down there where I'm at. And, and she started talking and she said, preacher, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid to wait till you get done. She said, you're talking about being saved. She said, I've been a Catholic all my life. And she said, I, I'm just shaking. I feel like I need to get saved right now. Boy, that service went to another level. Amen. It had nothing to do with the preacher. God showed up there. Things like that happen when the Lord shows up. Amen. And listen to this. I want to make this point. His presence can be enjoyed and his power experienced, but preaching can be more effective. And I say that when the Lord shows up, lives are changed. And, and I mean by this is Paul said, my preaching came not unto you in word only. So that tells me there is a word only. Amen. But he said, in power and of the Holy Ghost and much assurance. So when the Lord's there, your, your whole, your life can be changed. In other words, it's not just truth or we'd pass out Bibles tonight and everybody would be fixed. It's touch on truth. Amen. Amen. It's the touch of God on a preacher on truth. Now, of course, I'm, I'm going to preach in, in this text here in just a minute, but let me, let me say a few things. I believe we'd all agree the kind of church Jesus would go to. I, I know you'd think he would go to a Baptist church. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy and proud of being a Baptist. I'm thankful. I've never been tempted to take it off of our sign. 
Um, I, I believe, I, I don't believe that Baptists are all the saved, amen, but I believe the, they're right doctrinally, amen. And so I'm thankful, I believe the doctrine is right, salvation by grace, through faith. There's not, you can't work your way. Jesus not going anywhere where you got to work your way. He died on the cross. He's not going where they work their way. So I believe I'm, I'm right that he's, he'd go to a Baptist church. I know he would go to a Bible preaching church. Amen. Everywhere he went, when he got them in the house there in Mark chapter 2 and the place got full, he preached the word of God unto them. The Bible said Jesus' ministry uh, started and began with him going throughout Galilee preaching the gospel. Boy, you ought to thank the Lord tonight that you've got a church where the preeminence is on the preaching. Amen. Amen. The Lord's going to go where they make much of preaching. I've been to places where they sing for an hour and a half and they get a preacher up and tell him that he's got to put it in there in 10 minutes. Amen. Listen, put the preeminence on preaching. Thank God for a place that loves preaching. And it shows up on you that you like preaching around here. Amen. Amen. So a Bible preaching church, and, and I think he would go to a, to a bold church. I don't think he would go to a place where everything's a gray area. Somebody said uh, one time, they said, Brother Philbeck, I love you. I love you. He said, but you're just too dogmatic. And he, I said, well, you, let me say this. I said, if you ever thought about Jesus Christ was the most dogmatic man that ever lived. He said, I am the way, the life, the truth. No man comes upon the Father but by me. He said, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. He's a dogmatic. Ain't it amazing how we want, a, we want a dogmatic doctor? Don't be trying nothing. You don't know where. Be dogmatic if you work on me. I care about my wife's husband. Amen. I want a dogmatic doctor. And we want a dogmatic airplane pilot. Amen. Yes, sir. We want him to be dogmatic. Don't you try nothing. I want it to be right. But then when we get to the preaching, we don't want the preacher to be dogmatic. But I like a place that's not got a lot of gray areas. Amen. Amen. And then I think he would go, and then we'll look in the text. I think he would go to a, to a busy church. Uh, the Bible says Jesus tasted death for every man, that he would have all men to come to the knowledge of the truth, that he's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. I believe that it, Jesus dying for sin, if he's going to show up, he's going to go to a place that's busy and got a burden for souls. Amen. Can I say this? The greatest threat to this great church that I'm standing in tonight is not some kind of apostasy or some kind of heresy. The greatest threat and danger is not, is not worldliness coming in. You've got a preacher. You've got a man of God that's going to make sure that don't happen. But the greatest threat and danger of, 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 of this church is getting apathetic, becoming eased at Zion, becoming careless and cold towards a world that Jesus died for. Amen. You better believe that's right. Amen. I'm convinced they show up where folks have a burden for souls. Let's look in the text. I want to give you quickly tonight four characteristics of a church that I think Jesus would go to. Now, look at verse number 13. I think he would go to a church where, where the people are faithful. He says in verse 13, And he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, here it is, there shall meet you a man. Now, I, I'm looking at this thing, and Jesus said, We're going to have church, and we're going over there where there's a man, but he's going to be there when you get there. He's not, he's not going to be off that day, and he's not going to be doing nothing else. He's going to be there when the, on, the, on the time when the Lord shows up to have church. He's going to be there. Amen. Don't you wish you had about a thousand like that? Amen. This man was faithful. Amen. Jesus said, Where we go into church, people's going to be faithful. They're going to show up. We live in, the, in a day, friend, when church attendance across the globe is at an all-time all low. Do you agree with that? Amen. Listen, there, it's a, it's, it is a miracle what God is doing around this place. This many people out on a Monday night, what a blessing. Gee, amen. That's, that's why we felt his presence already here tonight. Amen. But there's some that in these last days, there's uh, somebody asked me, said, Preacher, did you lose anybody to COVID? And, and I said, yeah, well, uh, not physically, but I lost a lot spiritually. 
We have several, several folks. It's, it's almost like they was looking for a reason. And, it, and when, you, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out this COVID was an attack on the church. Make your mind up. You're going to be faithful to church. Hallelujah. Uh, we have a camp meeting every year, and we have preaching all day. And uh, some, of the, some great members, folks that I have at church, been there for years and years. And all of a sudden, they started saying, well, I can't. I can't sit there that long. And I, and, uh, and I said, uh, and there was a gang of them. They were talking about how they were going to come to one service in the morning, then come back maybe to the second preacher at night. And, uh, and boy, I know them all. They're just country boys. And I said, fellas, I said, I have been deer hunting with you folks this, in the last year. And you sat in a deer stand. Amen. And me have to beg you to come out for dinner. Amen. And I said, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's bring them ladder stands and them, and them lock-ons and put them in the vestibule area. Oh, their face got red. And then I said, well, bring your race cushion. Amen. Or, oh, what about the ball chair, the ball field chair? Amen. That thing's comfortable. Amen. Uh, we do what we want to do, and we make excuses for what we do not want to do. Amen. That's exactly right. People's here tonight because they want to be, and the ones that's not here, they don't want to be here. Amen. But the lives of people that are falling apart are people that are not faithful to church a lot of times. Amen. I know it don't happen up here, but where I'm at, a lot of times on Monday, I spend a lot of the time on Monday dealing with folks who was not there on Sunday. Oh, you would never know how it feels to be a preacher and you work. God gives you a message on maybe fighting the devil. Boy, and you pour your heart out on Sunday night about that thing. And then somebody calls you and says, Preacher, can I meet with you? And you rush to them and you meet them and they say, Well, I've just been fighting the devil. And I need some instructions on fighting the devil. And I thought, I just preached an hour on that last night. Amen. Listen to me. Your preacher does a lot of good counseling right here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. You'll get your best right here. Amen. Amen. Just, just make yourself be faithful. As you see a day approaching, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. If we ever need a word from God, it's right now in these days. Our families need to be in church more now than ever. Amen. Some, one, here soon you're going to have somebody you love, somebody you run with, maybe somebody you go to church with, and folks, some folks are going to bail out through this. Some folks are going to fall out through this. Just make your mind up you're going to be faithful. Amen. Amen. Listen to me. The people's going to be faithful. But then in verse number 13, look at it with me. Shall meet you a man, verse 13, bearing a pitcher of water. The Bible says, follow him. The people will be faithful, but I believe I can pull out of this verse that the pastor will be followed. Now, he says, uh, he says, the man's bearing a pitcher of water. Water all through your scripture, all through your Bible is a type of the word of God. So this man, this man that Jesus said to go follow, now you agreed with me that they was going to church, amen, and they was there, they was faithful, and then this man they're going to follow is carrying a pitcher of the word of, of, of water, which is the word of God. You can't tell me that I ain't a pitcher of a Baptist preacher. Amen. Jesus said, I'm going over there where they follow the man of God. Amen. Amen. Follow the preacher. Follow the man of God. Amen. There's blessings in that. Now, notice with me, verse 15, he said, notice where the water, this man with the water led them. He said, and he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. Make ready for us. In other words, the people that followed the man of God. Listen now, we're going somewhere. He said, if you'll follow the man of God, he's going to take you to an upper room. In other words, the man with the water, no, nobody else could do this, but the man with the water could, could lead them to the upper room, to, the, to, to higher ground, where you got better vision, amen? And by the way, the ones that got to have sweet fellowship with the Lord Jesus around the table followed the man with the water. Amen. I'm for one. I don't think you can be right with God, not be right with your preacher. Amen. I'm also, I also know in a crowd this size, there's going to be somebody that the devil fights trying to get you crossed up with your preacher. Amen. 
I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I, I got a pastor about 375 or 400, and we have 100, good, 100 young people pre-COVID. 100 young people singing in the choir, and a lot of them preacher. Their, their, people, their parents have been with me for 20-plus for years, and they have been with me, and I looked and, and saw the folk, your young folks singing how good they was doing, and I thought about our, young, our youth choir, how their parents was with me when, when they had to give me the benefit of the doubt. When, when, uh, when way back yonder, when different families was leaving, and uh, boy, I'm going down memory lane right now. And some of those parents, they just, they meant that they was going to follow me. They was going to let me be the leader. They was going to hold my arms up. They was going to help me. And today, to, I'm getting to preach to their grandkids. I'm getting to preach to their children. Some of the greatest Christians I know, Brother Michael Lindsay, my helper's here, and he'll, he'll tell you this, some of the greatest Christians I know is in our youth group. Walk with God. And their parents stayed with the preacher. Some of them, when their own friends turned on the man of God, they, they said, God put me here, and I'm going to stay here. And boy, God, I'm telling you, God has blessed their youngins. And whether we like this or not, the, the Bible teaches this. When God wanted to fellowship, wanted fellowship in the Garden of Eden, he raised up a man, Adam. God, God leads by a man. Hey Amen. You say, you say, I believe. This. You say, preacher, you don't know where you're preaching at. I know in a crowd this big, there's somebody that needs this tonight. When God needed fellow, wanted fellowship, he raised a man. When he wanted to lead three or a million or so Jews out of Egypt, he raised up Moses. When he wanted to take them across into Canaan land, he raised up Joshua. When he wanted to start seven churches of Asia Minor, he raised up a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. And when God wants to lead this church, he raised up a man, amen, and he's going to lead that man. And that man will give an account, Hebrews 13, by himself of this great church. I couldn't help but feel his burden when he got to saying about, about, what, what about mask and what to do and having to take step backwards. There is nothing that's been more heavy on my heart trying to keep wanting to please so many people and, and everybody. If you talk to this one, they say, I'm not wearing nothing. I want to I'm gonna, I wanna shake hands with everybody. And you got a crowd over here that thinks they're still wanting to be in the parking lot. They think they're going to die if you, if you slow down by them. Amen. Hypochondriacs. Amen. And then right in the middle of all that and everybody in between, you've got a man of God who's trying to seek the mind of God and the will of God and the devil on each shoulder saying you shouldn't do this and you should do that. And there's never been a how-to book on COVID. Amen. And you know how stressful it's been on you and your family. It's been just as stressful, if not more, on your man of God. Amen. Get behind your man of God. Amen. Amen. Listen to me. There'll be a crowd and it, soon coming. There'll be somebody want to leave the church. They're going to get on Facebook and they're going to get on the, on the social media and they're going to go to giving parables about what's wrong with your church. And, you know, they're cowards now. They're, they're cowards or they to talk to the preacher before they left. They'll get, on, they'll get on Facebook and they'll run down the pastor, run down the church, and they'll be saying, I'm over here and I'm outside of bondage. I'm loose from my bondage now. I, God has set me free from legalism. I just love it over here where I can do like I want to and dress like I want to. Amen. The only person that I've got less confidence in that outfit is somebody that befriends them and talks to them every day. Amen. That is poison to your ears. Amen. Hey, between you and shipwreck is a man of God with some water. Amen. Between your children and the devil is a man of God that's been down behind in the well drawing water before you ever get up. Gets between you and shipwreck. Thank God for a preacher. Amen. Hallelujah. God's been good to us. Amen. Get behind your preacher. I've got some Abishai's down there. Uh, they ain't all the way saved yet. Amen. And uh, boy, they love their preacher. 
Amen. You can't even hold a kid with me. They'll, they take it serious. But I appreciate them. I've got some men that's, that's helped me, and they, they don't allow. If, if the heat gets too hard and somebody gets to talking, they go to them and say, listen, we love you. We want you here. We need you here. But you're going to have to get, you're going to have to quit giving the problems to the preacher. You know, they're kind of, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to get away, you're going to get off of the preacher. I appreciate that. God bless a bunch of Abishai's. Amen. David couldn't half do his job because Abishai was trying to come out from around David, cut somebody's heads off. You said something about David, you was a dead man. Amen. Amen. Don't do that, but take up for your preacher. Amen. Preacher friend of mine called just this last week and said that he said that he had a crowd that got crossed up with him over something about COVID, over something about whether or not to do certain things. And, it, and that crowd got another crowd involved, got another family involved. And before you know it, he said, I've got four or five families. He said, preacher, I'm laying up at night trying to figure out what to do. And he said, this one crowd just seems like they're just full of the devil. And they're, they're, they're trying to attack the man of God. And here's this preacher on the phone weeping. And I'm thinking, boy, God help people that'll do stuff like that. You watch somebody that tries to talk you into believing something bad about your church or your preacher. They are poison. Amen. We had a big meeting planned up like this one time, a big youth meeting, and a man was coming. And I called his pastor, and he said that evangelist had took, had took 20, no, it took 85 people out of his church. And, and the evangelist and his brother went and started the church. And the pastor wept and cried and, and, and broke my heart. He, had to, he was having to get rid of his buses. I mean, it, it literally tore his church up. One man, one man, and a helper took 85 people out of a church. The pastor went on vacation, and while he was gone, they, they, they were in the pulpit, and they just, they just tore it all to pieces. Well, then the evangelist calls me and says, uh, Preacher, are we still running that revival? And it was just next week. And I said, Brother, can I ask you a question? I said, Did you take folks out of that church? He said, I didn't take them. They followed me. I said, Well, the, you're not coming. I'm scared to be around you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I said, now down here where we from, we backers and all, but I, people get killed doing stuff like that. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Yeah. You better, you sure ain't preaching for me, and he's never preached in our place again. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Yeah. Hey, Amen. I'm yeah. telling you, I don't see how you can love the church and harm it. Yeah. Can I say this? I don't know why I'm on this tonight, but if you know if you get crossed up and you leave, you're going to go over there or over here, and you know what you're going to find over there? You're going to find the same problems with a different face. Yeah. And you say, well, the preacher hurt my feelings here. I promise you, if the devil hears you say that, you're going to get over there. What are you going to do when they hurt your feelings? And, and your letter is going to be in the post office more than it is in the church office. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And what happens is, what happens, they hear, they hear you run down the preacher. Then we go to another church, and we want to exalt and, and, and magnify this preacher. And the youngers are saying, what's wrong with that preacher, I guess? What's wrong with this preacher? Something's wrong with the other one. I like the other preacher. Amen. You cut their here and ear off spiritually. It's a dangerous thing. I didn't come say all that, but it's a, it's a dangerous thing. You know what your preacher does? I may not get off of this. Do you know what your preacher does? He's a spiritual surveyor. I, I thought about this a few years back. I got our land surveyed. My little, I say land, it's less than an acre, but it's big to me. And uh, so we're, I'm, I'm getting them to survey it. And that guy come out and he said, well, you'll never believe what happened. He said, the lines are in the same place they was. He said, last time I was here, you didn't have no children. He said, your families grew. You got more people living here, but the lines ain't changed. I, th I walked off thinking, there's got to be some kind of preach in that. Yeah. And I thought, I went and told my wife, and, she, and, it, and my wife come up with this. I said, I said, you know, he said, our families grew and everything's changed, but the lines of, of, our, lines of our boundaries ain't changed. And she said, yeah, she said, because most folks change the boundary when their kids get to be teenagers. I said, hey, but you know what you got a preacher for? You got a preacher. You got a preacher. Here's what happens. Somebody comes in. Your pastor studies, studies the book and marks the lines. 
Amen? He studies the book and marks the lines. That's what his job is, study the book. You say, well, I, I thought I ought to have some input on that. Well, the only thing wrong with that is you're wrong. The past, he's going to give an account, not you. He's going to give an account for where the lines are. Real quickly, we was going to buy some property in South Carolina. I looked up the for sale sign. I said, boy, I, I told my wife, I said, I think the Lord wants us to have that. She said, we went to looking for where the boundaries was. And a little neighbor come over, a man did, and he, I, he said, that boundary is right there at that oak tree. I said, well, that's more land than I thought it was. Well, before we got through talking, his neighbor come out. And we're still standing there at that tree. And he says, you know, the line goes all the way down there to that branch. Said, I said, well, I thought it stopped at the tree. Well, then there two are arguing. Well, come to find out it was in the middle between there. Well, we go to the other side. And we're just walking around that day. It's beautiful outside. And, and I said, uh, the, the guy that was showing the land, I said, where's the boundary on this part? He said, well, there was some paint here. And he said, be totally honest with you, I don't know. He said, we, we thought it was here. And said, some folks thought it went all the way to that ditch. I thought, well, I'd kind of like to know where the boundaries was if I was going to be interested in it. And we turned, and my wife was walking down the, the, the road, and we was just trying to get with the Lord about whether we ought to go any further. And there's a little woman come walking down the road. I'll never forget this. Like a, she, had a, she looked like a little house on the prairie dress. <laughs> hey, yeah, my kind. I... I, I knew she was saved, and I said, uh, <laughs> I said, ma'am, I said, uh, how are you doing? I was just going to talk to her. I love to talk to people like that. And um, she said, what are you folks doing? I said, well, we're looking to buy this property. I said, but you know, I said, I've been told that the line goes to the tree, goes to the sign, goes down to the creek, and, and I've been told here it goes all the way to the ditch. And she said, they've been fussing about them boundaries. She said, they've been fussing about them boundaries for 25 or 30 years. She said, but I can tell you what you do. She said, if you'll go down to the courthouse, she said, they've got a book down there. I still see that little woman saying that. She couldn't understand why I was jumping up and down when she told me that. She said, you can go down to the courthouse and you get a book. And she said, it don't matter what nobody around there says where them boundaries are. She said, you'll find out they never changed. Your preacher, listen to me, your preacher checks the book, marks the boundaries. Somebody comes in and they try to move the boundary. Amen. Maybe on the music, they try to move it, and your pastor moves it back. See, you can't do that, but your pastor can. Then, amen, and somebody tries to move it doctrinally. They try to bring in some, some heresy, heresy doctrine. Your pastor's role, God trusts him, to study the book and mark that line again. Amen. Then there'll be somebody come in, amen, last days, and try to move it when it comes to modesty. Amen. Well, we feel like it ought to be somewhere in here. Amen. But your preacher studies the book, and he shows where the line is. That's his job. He studies the book, marks the lines. Amen. God bless a preacher. Do you have any idea what this place would look like tonight if you did not have a man of God that marked the boundaries? Amen. Thank God for a boundary marking preacher. Most folks in church tonight don't know nowhere. They don't even know where the boundaries are. But your preacher's got enough backbone, amen, to keep the kudzu and the weeds put back where at least your family will know where the boundaries are. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for a preacher. Listen, I'm done. Look here. People will be faithful. The pastor will be followed. And then the people will be friendly. Notice in verse 14, when they get there, the Bible said, he shall go in and shall say to the good man of the house, there's going to be a good man. That good man is, do you know, he's a waiter. He's a He's, uh, he's, he's somebody that's going to be friendly and show you around. He's like a greeter. Jesus said, here's what Jesus said, is your first time visitors. You're, you've never been there before. But when you get there, there's going to be a greeter. There's going to be somebody to wait on you. They're going to take care of you. Amen. You look up the word greeter and it's so, somebody that show, it shows acts of kindness to you. 
Just make sure you've got everything you need. I'm going to tell you what I love about this church and many others that I've been to lately is being friendly. It don't cost nothing. Amen. Jesus said where we go, there's going to be somebody greeting people. Amen. Boy, I'm glad he stopped us from shaking hands because I done shook 150 tonight. Amen. I tried to sneak one more in back there and the fellow wouldn't do it. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Friendliness. Listen to this. The reason it's so much to me, and I'll tell you this and we'll be done. The reason it means so much to me, the night I got saved, I had long hair. I, was, I had been uh, uh, in, in deep sin. And the night I went to church, I walked in, and I knew I did not look like the people. I knew I didn't, I knew that I didn't fit in. And the first thing I thought was, these people do not want me here. They don't want me here. They know, they know I'm not like them. And I'm going to tell you, the Lord knows that. This is what the Lord done. The first fella walked up and said, sir, can I get your name? And I told him. He said, boy, we're so glad you're here. And he grabbed my grabbed him by the arm there, and he's, he said, let me introduce you to my wife, let me introduce you to my uncle, and come over here. Where are you going to sit at? You need somewhere to sit? And I thought, boy, friendly folks, walked across the aisle to sit down, and another man come up, real old man, older man, and he said, uh, what's your name, sir? I mean, these folks are coming to me. Won't let me sit down. And he said, uh, what's your name? And I said, my name is Barry Philbeck. He said, Barry Philbeck. He said, Barry. And he just looked at me real, real funny, and I started to walk off, and, and uh, he turned and went and got his wife, and here they come running back. Both of them had tears running down their face. And they pulled out their little prayer list and said, Barry Philbeck. <laughs> said, we've been praying. And this man's having a fit. He said, I prayed for you, and you come to church. I mean, he meant that thing. And I thought, these people love me. I'm telling you, sinners won't get saved if they don't think you want them there. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. That's hey, this area owes us nothing. They don't have to, there's nowhere demands them to come to church. We're demanding to go after them. Right. One of the greatest things you can do, you remember when somebody comes in, no matter what they look like, the devil's telling them, the devil's telling them they don't fit in. They're not going, they're not going to work out here. Nobody wants them. They already know they don't look like. Those folks looked at me, and see, I was, a, I was a lost man. I could look at somebody. I could watch them. I knew what they thought about me. They never one time looked at my hair. They never did look at my clothes. They just loved me. And about 30 minutes later, I got born again that night. So I'm very big. I'm very big on being friendly. Very big on being friendly. Let me just read these off. The place will be furnished in verse number 15. Furnished and prepared. Somebody had been busy. That word means it lacked nothing. It had all they needed. Furnished and prepared. The place will be furnished. Somebody, somebody was staying over, working. Somebody was coming in early. Somebody, that place was furnished and prepared when they got there. That tells me there was some work going on. Everybody couldn't be the last ones in and the first ones out. Some folks, I don't think they turned their car off. Amen. They back way, park way out there. They come in. They come in right as the service starts, and you better not get in their way. Amen. But this place wasn't like that. Somebody who had to do the work. Places I go, about 30% of the crowd are wore out. Wore out. 30% of the people having to carry a lot of the load. There's no sense in that. We're not going to give but one chance to pass through this life. I want, all, I want to do all I can for the glory of God. Praise. Listen to me. Praise will be, if you'll let me say it this way, praise will be first. But it'll be priority. And let me tell you why. They're going to worship. They're going to reflect back. That's what the Lord's Supper is. So they're going literally with one purpose in mind, to reflect back on how good God's been to them. Now I'm going to ask you something. The kind of church Jesus would go to. He said, he said we're going over there where where we're going for the purpose of reflecting back. What if everybody in this building come to church tomorrow night, you come back in here Sunday morning, and you had one purpose on your mind? You, when you walked in those doors and you sat down, you had one purpose on your mind, and that's to give God the glory for, for redeeming you. 
you'd, you'd have to direct traffic, friend. Amen. Jesus said, I'm going where they don't mind worshiping the Lord. I don't know if you realize what you got here. I really, I, I want you to, don't never take it for granted. There's, they tell me there's 7 billion people in this world or more, and most of them will never get to walk in a place like this. They'll never hear choir music like that. Most of them will never hear a preacher like yours. God has been good to us. Your preacher's begging the Lord for revival this week. Well, we'd all take revival. We'd gladly receive it if we didn't have to change. But if we see revival this week, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to accept the fact that we've got to change some things. Amen. Amen. God bless you, preacher. Would you stand to your feet tonight?